The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them, Jesus addressed this parable. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided his property up between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, Quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked them what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when, and, he refused, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in, rep in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your, your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I'm actually going to need this. <laughs> okay. Well, today is Laetare Sunday, which is why we're wearing pink today. Rose, not pink. And God gives us a great reason to rejoice. He gives us the parable of his mercy, the parable of the prodigal son. And so, you know that I like to start many of my homilies with uh, stories or movies, but you really can't improve on the story that Christ gives us today. 
It's one of his greatest parables and one of the ones that has the most to say to us. And so let's just look at it together and see which son we are. Maybe we're both. And figure out what the true message here is in the prodigal son. Because we start off with two sons, an older and a younger. And the older son asks the father for his share of the inheritance now. Now, of course, in Jewish times, as it is today, inheritance was usually given at the time when the father died. This is the time before living trusts and uh, death taxes, things like that. And so what the son's really saying to the father is, I would rather you be dead. I want my inheritance now. And the father, rather than refusing his son, gives him the option of leaving, gives him, his, gives him the inheritance right then. And the son takes this great inheritance and goes out of the father's house. And that idea of the, wanting the father to be dead is really what we do every time we sin. We're saying that we know better, that we want to take the inheritance that God gives us and pretend that he doesn't exist. Pretend that the commandments that he gives us are not for our own good. Pretend that there is no God and we can live without him. And so the younger son sets off and he goes out and lives a life of dissipation, of debauchery. And he spent everything he was given by the father. I think it's fair to say he himself was just utterly spent. And we each struggle with our own set of sins based on our own human nature. And whatever it is or whatever they are, when we engage in those sins freely, I don't think any of us ever get to the end and say, well, that was worthwhile. Glad I did that. You know, that worked out very well for me. No, the commandments of God are given in love because he knows what's going to make us happy and what's going to leave us spent with nothing. And indeed, he does have nothing because then... He hires himself out to local citizens, and they send him to feed the swine. Now remember, in Jewish culture, the swine were the lowest of all the animals. Unclean to touch, unclean to eat. And here he was acting as a servant to the swine. You can't get lower than that in Hebrew culture. He eventually, though, came to his senses, because he had, literally had nothing. He longed for the things that he was feeding the swine. And he decides to get up and go back to his father's house. But not as a son. He decides to go back as a servant. And the word servant is where we get the idea of servile fear. You know, we're supposed to have that fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord that we're supposed to have is filial fear, the fear of a son. The fear of a son who knows the love of the father, who knows that the father is so loving that he's afraid to displease him. Not out of fear, really, but out of love. There's a fear to disappoint God the Father. Servile fear is fear of punishment, fear that a servant might have if he didn't do his job. In those days, they could be beaten, sent away, starved. And so that's the kind of fear that we have here. He wants to go back and not be a son, but be a servant. But when he walks back, the father doesn't wait for him to get to the house. The father runs out and meets him before he ever gets there. God the Father, the moment we turn away from sin, is waiting for us. He never leaves us. We walk away from him like the son. And yet, when we turn around and make that first movement back, he runs to greet us. The image would be that it's not so much that God is waiting for us in the confessional, though he is, but the moment we turn away from sin and decide to repent in our lives, God the Father joins us and walks with us to the confessional and then meets us in there. And that's where the celebration takes place, the celebration of the sacrament. But that's not where we first encounter God. And so the Father greets him. And he tells him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. And that's the first true thing he said. None of us deserve to be God, called God's son or daughter. 
There's none of our own merits that do it. It's a free gift. And so the son is saying something true here, but the father doesn't want to hear it because he knows that the son doesn't deserve to be called his son. Instead, he calls to the servants and says, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Kill the fatted cat and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast. So he's putting the clothing, the ring of authority, the ring would have been what the son wore to show his authority in the house, just as we're baptized priest, prophet, and king. The father is restoring the dignity of the sonship to the son. And then the celebration begins, the celebration of the one lost sheep that is greater than the 99 who never strayed. Now the other son comes back and he hears the party going on. And so he calls for a servant. And he finds out that his brother, who went away squandering the fortune that he had been left, has now returned. And rather than being punished, being made a servant, he's been accepted back as a son. And he doesn't even accept the fact that this is his brother. He says to his father when his father comes out, this son of yours squandered everything on prostitutes. Now, nowhere here does it say that he spent his money on prostitutes. He might have, but it talks about how he lived in dissipation. But the younger son, or the older brother assumes the worst. He's judging things that he doesn't even know about. And he's also denying the fact that this is even his brother, that this person is worthy of being called the son of his father. And then the father tells him, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours, but we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. So the father is now trying to draw the sons back together into a cohesive union of a family. And we often put ourselves, I think, in the position of the older son or the younger son, the one who ran away, because we all are in need of forgiveness. But we should also put ourselves in the position of the older son, because how many times do we judge those around us and for, deny them the for, same forgiveness that we expect to receive from the Father, denying that the people in the church are, in fact, our brothers and sisters. It happens all the time. It happens in big ways, grudges that we've held about people who have hurt us, or being unable to forgive wrongs that have been placed in our lives, not wanting to admit that people are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we owe them the same forgiveness that we ask for almost constantly. It's in little ways too. If somebody shows up late to church or to a concert or anything, if it's us showing up late, we know all the reasons, and we excuse ourselves. But if you watch somebody else coming in late, then it becomes, well, that person couldn't even get out of bed in time to make it to Mass in a timely manner. It's always a, a, easy to justify and excuse ourselves, but never those around us. Or when you're at a stoplight and you get distracted, and somebody honks you, to me, this happens to me sometimes, I think to myself, oh, I was doing something important. You know, I was changing the channel, or that was a, an important email I was checking on my seat during the stoplight. But if somebody else is at the stoplight and misses it, then I get very angry. And I think, well, that person was just texting and driving when they shouldn't have been, and now I'm going to be late. It's always easy to excuse ourselves, but never the other person. And so really the message of this gospel is not only the forgiveness of the Father, but the cohesive union that we are as a family of God. Because look at who he's addressing. It's the Pharisees and scribes, those older brothers. So on this Laudete Sunday, Laetare Sunday, I should have studied Latin better, Laetare Sunday, we have to be both brothers. Because there are times when we need forgiveness and we should know that the Father is waiting to run out to us. And there are times when we have to forgive others in that same vein. And when we do that, 
then we become the family of God. And that is really what it means to be the mystical body of Christ.